everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm Molly Starbath, Director of the Office of Postdoctoral Services, and today's workshop is part of the Academic Job Search Series, which is co-sponsored by the Duke Graduate School and Duke Graduate Career Services. So today's uh, topic is productive professor or foibling faculty, starting your new <laughs> academic position right. I wish I'd come up with that, that's a great title. And um, we are going to be discussing, well we'll start out by discussing Dr. Mohamed Moore's excellent book. So you're hired now what? A Guide to New Science Faculty, and you can check this out from the Office of Postdoctoral Services if you're a postdoc, and I believe you can also get it from the Career Center or the Graduate School if you are a graduate student. And today, Dr. Noor is joined by Allison Ashley Kosh, who is professor in the Division of Medical Genetics, Department of Medicine, <laughs> and by Jennifer Roizen, rhymes with poison, I will never forget that, um, <laughs> who is assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry. And so we said that this was an informal discussion, which is kind of hard to do because everybody's in the auditorium seated. But if anybody wants to be brave and move down, we're just going to try to keep the questions open and and I think Dr. Moore has a handout, and you guys probably want to start by introducing yourselves briefly, and then we'll go from there. So let's thank our speakers very much for coming today. Um, so I'm Jennifer Risen, and my guess is that I'm here principally because I'm relatively new faculty, and so I can give you a sense of what the first couple of years are like um, without the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> Jenny, very modest, she's very successful, sir. <laughs> my, my name is Mohammed Noor, as you're from all. I should, I, let me say a couple of things about this real quick in case you get to the, I should, I should stress, I have no expertise that is unique to why I, I wrote the book. I was just very bold at some point, having that was mad that it wasn't something like this. There are some books out there about managing the lab. There's a great one by Kathy Barker. I, actually, that came out after I'd already started as a faculty member, so it was unfortunate for me in terms of timing. But it was very focused on just one thread of it, which is specifically managing the lab and not just the overall job as a new faculty member. And there's a lot of things in there which, which, there's a lot of things about the job which are not in the book. Like, for example, anything about teaching whatsoever was not in the book whatsoever at all. Um, I used to give a couple of talks, and Molly actually invited me to give talks before, and at some point in time somebody said, why don't you like sit down and write a book? So I wrote one. It was interesting, actually. I wrote it. It's, as you can see, it's very short. And it's very just conversational tone. I remember when I gave it originally to the, the publisher, he actually said he was, quote, nonplussed, which I had to look up what that word meant. It <laughs> was nonplussed at how short it was. Like, that's it? But what, what was funny is then when the reviews of it started coming out, every one of them said, we really appreciate the short format. <laughs> so, yeah, did something right. Uh, again, I have no expertise. This is... This was just a, like, here's stuff that I did completely wrong, and hopefully I can tell people about it so you guys don't make all the stupid mistakes I made as I started as a faculty member. And there's a lot of, because I mean, as you imagine, when you're starting as a new faculty member, I mean, what have you been trained at? You've been trained at doing research. You've been trained at designing research, doing research, writing research. You get to the jobs that we're doing right now, and like, yes, we have to do that. Yeah. The, the doing is a little bit less. It's more the designing and stuff like that. There's some of the doing for some of us. But, there's all this other stuff about management, which we had zero training in, and we usually suck at. Basically, our entire, our entire training in management is seeing how our advisors sucked and not doing that. Right? That's pretty much what we do is we try to compensate for that. Um, yeah, I was about to give a story on that, but I shouldn't. <laughs> 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 um, there's all this, all, everything about teaching, and people say, well, I TA. Like, TA, yeah, come on. Uh, I mean, that, there's no similarity between TA and actually teaching. It's, it's almost you know, a completely different volume. The, the closest thing I can say is like, you, you prepare before for giving a seminar, right? Every one of you here has given seminars before, right? Imagine giving a seminar every other day on a topic you don't know so well. That's teaching, <laughs> right? The good thing is it's a friendly, a friendly audience. They know even less than you. <laughs> so you go in there and, and you can do it. It takes on the order of like six hours to make a one hour lecture. So it is an inordinate amount of time. And then there's all this like service, which I mean, you don't even know what it is until you get there. And all of a sudden you're in these committees that you have to sit there and they're, they're, they're long and they're slow. And at the end you think, like, do we actually do anything? But you have to do a lot of that. But then there's also like, there's good service too. That's the bad service. But there's good service too, like reviewing papers, which I mean, some of you, actually probably most of you here have reviewed some papers. But you're going to get asked to review a paper like every other week. You're going to be invited to grant panels. And, you know, if you're on an NSF grant panel, you may get a stack like up to 20 grant proposals to actually review in detail in a month. So it's basically like, you know, grant proposal a night. And it has to be like insightful because you know people's lives are at stake, right? I mean, there are people who are gonna get fired because they did or didn't get this grant. I mean, not, not them themselves necessarily, maybe them themselves necessarily, but uh, like their staff and things like that. So it really matters to me to do it. So there's a lot that goes on, there's a lot of time in Actually, I brought a handout. Yeah. Yes. It's, I'll warn you, it's, it's, 
it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a time management exercise that I give in one of my classes. Basically, like, it, I give you a number of hours for the week, and I give you all this set of stuff, and then you just try to say, like, okay, how much time am I going to put in every one of these buckets? So, we're not going to actually go over it right now, but I want you to just try it out somewhere. No, it's, it's definitely sobering. But it's, it's a good <laughs> exercise just for seeing, like, what all has to be going on. Um, and again, like as this illustrates too, a big part of our job is of course a lot of organization. Mm -hmm. You guys have a lot of questions, so I'm not going to talk anymore, so we have time to get to those. We pass the time over to Allison. Sure. Just real quick, I, I'm a human geneticist, so I'm interested in finding human genetic variants and then functionally annotating them to try to figure out what those would be to So. So I'm crusty at the further end of the uh, sort of um, <laughs> career trajectory. I'm a full professor. Probably the unique piece that I bring to the people compared to these guys, you know, is that I'm on the medical school side. So, so I think people don't really see that there are really quite distinct differences between things that happen on the campus side versus the medical school side. You know, like mom, I'm very passionate about training. One of the sort of other hats I wear is director of graduate studies for the genetics, genomics graduate program. Um, so I, yeah. You guys want to ask us questions? Do you want us to go through the list? I know you guys submitted a list of like 20 questions to have in your home. <laughs> to start you guys are too quiet. Yeah. Well, not be fun if you're this quiet. <laughs> we can start with the questions to get the ball rolling. So, a really popular one is basically who do you start with? Do you recruit a lab tech? Do you recruit a postdoc? Do you start with graduate students? So, you walk into the lab and it's empty. What do you do? This is, I mean, a lot of the questions are actually kind of related to that in the sense of like how do you, how do you recruit people and things like that. Too. I mean, I mean, for me personally, like, there, there's nothing more important than recruiting good people. There's like no yeah. single barrier to success more than recruiting, more than poor recruiting. When you first get a faculty position, it's very tempting. Like, oh my God, my lab is empty. I just came from the lab with 40 postdocs. <laughs> you know, I need to get people really fast. It's, it's very tempting, but it's a terrible thing to do too fast. If you, if you get a bunch of people very quickly, you're almost certainly not going to be being as selective as you probably should be. Um, Personally, I, and, and feel free to, sure. to give other points of view on it. I personally think that one of the best, if you have the, if you have the money to do it, and it very much depends on what job you end up getting, I very much think of a uh, technician as a very good way to start. Because it's somebody who's going to set up the lab for you, they're going to buy things, they're going to put things in drawers and label them, and they're going to oversee undergraduates, and they're going to get the ball wrong. If you bring in a grad student, I know a lot of grad students, and people already express this as DGS too, I know a lot of grad students who come into a brand new faculty member's lab, and there kind of isn't the lab. I mean, it's kind of, yes. There is a room with chairs, but there's no thermal cycler, there's no centrifuge, and, and they're like, okay, I need to go ask the PI for this, and then he, he or she orders it, and it takes three months yes. to get there. If you have a technician, they're going to be ordering everything and getting the lab ready to go. And I can tell you, too, that the most uh, influential paper I've ever published, so the one that has by far the highest citation of Aurora that I even think is most influential, the authors on it were me, technician, and two undergrads. So it's not that you know, every, it's not that all your productivity is going to be coming from your grad students and postdocs. It's, it's really good to have an established lab for them to come into, and therefore they can watch and really go, as opposed to just filling the lab with these people who then can't do their work. I think, uh, from my perspective, related to that, for you to have a successful academic career, you need a combination of people who are kind of constant who are going to remember where the hell is that plasmid and what freezer or blah, 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 blah. Or what was that family from Turkey? You know, where did we put those DNA samples? That kind of stuff. So, so you are going to need a nice mix of having staff who are there more consistently as well as the trainees. I mean, the trainees will sort of elevate the intellectual discussions and the sort of intellectual ideas, and you know, and they're gonna be very hardworking, as I'm sure all of you guys are, you know, and put in probably more hours than the staff put in. So, 
So you, you need a good mix of those, but at the end of the day, a graduate student is going to be gone in 5.7 years, you know, a postdoc is going to be gone in three years, something like that. So, so I agree completely with that. Well, so I took the approach of doing all of the ordering before I got here. I actually mm -hmm. smart. I actually found an auction in San Francisco, which was about an hour from where I was living. Um, bought all of this equipment by auction, some of the best stuff that I have. Went out there with uh, an undergrad I knew who was willing to be paid a small amount to help me pack glassware, right? Because I didn't want to spend my whole life doing that. And then um, basically had it. I bought it personally because it was wow. much cheaper, and then I had the school reimburse me um, for buying it, which was a big risk, but it meant that day one, I could get started in my lab. Mm -hmm. I could set it up, there was no waiting time. And so that, that was um, definitely something I am glad I did. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I was buying at a time when not all of the first year faculty members were buying, and so that meant that the deals were much better even if I wasn't getting it from an auction. And second of all, the thing, the thing that I wanted to be really careful about is you're training, you're mentoring and training people in culture as well as um, in techniques. And the culture I wanted to establish was not one where somebody sits around and waits for things to come in. So no matter who the person is, I wanted them to have access to whatever they needed to the extent that they could, right? I wanted it to be a culture where you don't have something, you go and you get it, and you get started and you do the experiments you need to do. Um, so, so there, you don't, I definitely didn't want to bring a grad student into a situation where they wouldn't have the equipment. And there was a student who is now in my lab, but who um, asked to join for the summer, and I said no. Uh, and that was probably one of the bigger risks I took. And I said, I don't want to train you to sit around and wait. You know, I want, I want you to be able to go. Um, the other thing, the, the question, though, was really about who do you hire first? And for me, when I got started, um, I was definitely tempted to take anybody off the street. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> really, anybody who looked good on paper, this is a human body. Uh, and I didn't do it. And I didn't do it because... Thank God. <laughs> um, I didn't do it because no one you work with ever is going to be perfect. I mean, look, okay, so you maybe some of you were married, right? Like, you picked your partner. It was an intensive process. Um, and, you know, that process still didn't result in a perfect match. It may be wonderful, but I guarantee you, you don't think all the time, this person that I invested so much time picking out is perfect. Um, I sort of think of the relationships you build when you um, have people join your lab analogously, right? You, you have to invest a small amount of time, several hours, to figure out what you think the strengths and the weaknesses of the relationship are likely to be, right? Because it's not all going to be strengths. I guarantee you everyone I work with can point to things they love and hate about me um, and vice versa. Right? It's just the way it's going to be. But, but it's similar to picking a job in that um, you want to pick people to work with where you think their strengths are going to complement your strengths and where you think um, you can live with their weaknesses. It's not going to drive you absolutely insane. And you can help, help them to fill those in. Um, I think the, the other thing related to that, you know, you guys probably don't appreciate this at this point. But you will spend more time and energy on the difficult yes. people, the, the difficult technician who rolls in three hours late, the graduate student who never shows up, that kind of stuff. So that's why, you know, just as Jenny said, you know, you really want to put the investment in in the beginning, you know, and as she said, it's not always going to be perfect. And even some of your best people will go through rough patches, right? You have to think about yourself, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you may have a period of time where your productivity is a little bit lower. 
you know, this is going to happen too. Right? The post office graduates, you know, is going to stop. But, it, but what you want to do is try to avoid picking someone who right off the bat, you know, you're kind of like, oh, I don't know if this person's going to work. So, so if you don't feel like they're a good fit from the beginning, probably the best thing to do is to say pass. One thing along those lines, too, is that it's just reference letters, I don't even know why we still do them. They suck. They're completely <laughs> useless. They, they, I mean, they're all lawyer-ready, right? Yes. So you sit there, you go through there, and you try to figure out, like, hey, they don't mention anything about effort. Maybe that uh, probably means they suck at effort. So <laughs> my personal advice on that, cold call the references. Just call, you know, ask who the references are, ask for a phone number, and just call repeatedly until you catch them. Or email them, like, very cryptically and say, can I speak with you? Don't say why. Cold call, and you'll get this whole, like, oh, yeah. You'll get, you'll get so much more information than you'll get from that lawyer-ready letter recommendation, which is completely worthless. Thank you. So how do we navigate, I imagine that there's some level of pressure from the department to take graduate students, right? Part of the reason they hired no. you was Pretty much none. to yeah. train, so none. Pretty much. I mean, if well, you haven't actually done by the time you go for tenure, people will think that's a little strange. Okay. Like, there's, there's no rush. No. no pressure. Now, um, in the department I'm in, which is chemistry, that they try to help us to recruit students, so they they sort of facilitate, facilitate mm -hmm. getting graduate students and getting excellent graduate students, um, but they try not to pressure junior faculty into taking anyone, specifically because they're investing a lot in us, mm -hmm. right? And whatever we can do to succeed, that's what they want most, mm -hmm. and they know that Every, everybody who's more senior knows that if you take a graduate student who's not a great fit for your lab, um, it's deadly. The one, the one potential exception to that is if there's a student who's already here mm -hmm. and they are leaving a lab, sometimes you, you, you might get a little bit of pressure of like, well, hey, the, you know, there wasn't a good personality match, would you be willing to do it? And actually, there's a former, a former lab member of mine who's now PI, and this person has encountered this problem where, where she's gotten a lot of pressure in her new faculty position to take on a particular student. My advice to her was like, if you're not comfortable, big X. And, and you know, just say, I'm free tenure, and put up the big X. And everybody's very sympathetic and say, I'm free tenure, and you know, they'll, they'll leave you alone. Yeah. If you're comfortable, then that's great, but if you're not comfortable. Uh, so two related questions. One is, uh, what about international students? I'm asking this because I'm actually, well, I wasn't international students. When I applied, I have like no idea about US education system. I pretty much picked grad school based on the information in Wikipedia. I'm surprised my advisor picked me. You know, there's like no good, understanding of both sides. And so what would you do? <laughs> like, well, right. How would you deal with that situation? Sure. And uh, the other question was, so let's say that you pick someone, and over time, it turns out that's a bad fit. What is the point that you have to say, all right, yeah. this is not working. Oh, yeah. this is my question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so regarding international students, so with international <laughs> students, I feel that the graduate programs are actually quite selective. So it's very competitive. There are not very many international graduate student slots, really, for any of the programs. So I can tell you about UPGG. You know, we may get, you know, a number of different applications, you know, and we will actually do Skype interviews, you know, and in some cases, We've actually had the opportunity if an international student happens to be in the U.S. for a conference or something like that, to actually physically see them as well. So, so I feel like with the international graduate students, you know, at least intellectually and academically and so forth, they're they're already at a pretty high level by the time they come to you. Now. One of the challenges you may have is communication, but the graduate school has lots of different things in place to improve that. So that's your first question. The second question <laughs> is, what happens when things don't go so well? Whether it's an international or a domestic student, it comes to the director of graduate studies. Now, it's always the first line of defense. You know, it, and if at different universities, my position may be titled something different, but <laughs> it, the basic idea is someone who's part of the administration of the graduate program 
really needs to intervene and listen sort of hear both sides of the story, you know, and really offer up a number of different solutions. The solutions can run the gamut. The best possible situation, there's a way to remediate the situation, to improve communication between the, the trainee and the advisor, you know, and they move forward together and have a successful outcome, the student graduates. Another scenario, Hey, Mohammed, I've got this problem graduate student. <laughs> Would you be willing to take them into your lab? You know, so the, the, the student, you know, and it, it's not necessarily that the student was a problem. It was just that the communication, exactly, the match wasn't a good match. So we've had those situations. At the more disappointing end of the spectrum, which has also happened, the student is just but, it, but these are all very, very careful decisions that are made, not just singularly with the PI, but at the graduate program and then the graduate school. So John Klingen Smith and I are like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Please. Um, I don't have a ton of experience in this, fortunately, but in Mohammed's book, one of the the sort of key points is that you want to document your interactions with students. Yeah. And I do probably 50% of what I would ideally do in that way. But, um, but when I have a problem pretty much of any sort, I treat it like an experiment, right? And so if I'm having um, positive and negative interactions with a student, I basically um, will take notes on that in a way that allows me to sort through it and think mm -hmm. through it in a way that's productive for me, but also allows me to figure out how to have a productive conversation. Because there will be challenges with every single mm -hmm. trainee, right? And part of what you want to work on is um, how to sort of take the strengths of the student and help them harness mm -hmm. those strengths in order to address the weaknesses. But there's also, you know, grad school isn't for everyone. Right. So yeah. in our department, if you survey the students, 50% of them, you of course survey them after they're already here, 50% of them aren't sure why they entered. And so um, you can imagine that that's a good indication that, um, that maybe it's not a purposeful decision for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to feel badly about actually thinking very carefully about what to do if there's a a problematic relationship with a student. You just have to treat it as a productive opportunity. Yeah. So that's the second yeah. question. And then, yeah. and then the first question, or you want to go well, on? Well, actually, I was going to have a slight answer. So okay. Go to the uh, and then your first question was? The international. The international students. Yeah. It sounds to me like you're asking from a department where you admit individual students to yourself. Is that correct? At least that's what, that's what my grad school you know, yeah. the, you, you weren't. I mean, you were admitted to the program, but there should have been at least one or two professors who were expressing, you know, an interest in you before the department. Was yeah. So some department. some departments admit to the department, and other departments admit to an individual PI. Um, and in the case of chemistry, we just started Skype interviewing all of the international students yeah. that were thinking about admitting before admitting them, and and we have found that that does actually change who we admit. Um, and we decided to do that on the basis of, I, probably for many reasons, but we'd heard that Caltech was doing that and I think MIT as well. Um, so it's something that's happening more nationally. Um, so in terms of, I want to make a tangent in terms of the problem student thing. So one of the hardest transitions of being a new PI is that you're no longer part of the lab the way you used to be part of the lab. Like you're used to being like, you know, you're in the know, you're a postdoc or a grad student, you can talk about everybody else with everybody else, exactly. and it's all, like, <laughs> as a PI, like when you hear, I mean, think about it, like when does your PI hear about a problem? They hear about it when it's first kind of barely there, they hear about it's bubbling up, they hear, about, no, they hear about when it's like, you know, the lab is about to burn down because they're all so <laughs> mad at each other, <laughs> or mad at you or something like that. Yeah. So you end up hearing things really, really, really late in the game, and that's a tough transition because you're used to being just one of the team, the other thing related to that is, is the way you speak to people has to change, and very consciously so, because 
You know, you can say something like, oh, that's dumb. You know, like, <laughs> you can say that when you're a postdoc to another postdoc. Yeah. You say that to, like, when you're a PA and you said to your grad student, they will leave the room and cry. I can guarantee you. They will <laughs> leave the room and cry. They will, and I can, I can tell you a thousand times that I've made that mistake of not thinking very carefully before you speak because your, your words now have this inordinate weight that they didn't used to have, like, 20 minutes earlier when you were a postdoc. So yeah. you have to be very careful with that. And then the last thing, so uh, Allison used the word communication several times. Just about any relationship of any sort, like your spouse, your parents, your kids, and your trainees, it almost always, almost always comes down to some sort of failure in communication. So the more you can do of that, the more formats and forums for communication with every individual in your lab, the less likely a problem will get to that exploding point before you know about it. The more likely you were able to address it earlier. Um, one of the points I wanted to make even just carrying something Jenny said a little bit further. You know, it, I, I think one of the hardest transitions as well is to accept failure, to accept that, you know, maybe this was not the right fit. You know, maybe I should not have asked this graduate student into my lab. You know, maybe our communication styles do not mesh well. You know, maybe this student really is better off finding a teaching job, you know, at a high school or something, because that's what their passion is. What, what I think all of us, sort of as we go through our own training, you know, we're always looking forward to what the proper career trajectory is. But one of the things which, which I have noticed, certainly being DGS, I would say the past five years or so, you know, there are a number of different trajectories, you know, and it's okay when that student comes to you and said, you know, I, I really don't know that I like this. You know, I'm not sure I really want to keep doing this. But I tell you what the distinction is, because you have two choices in that situation. You can get mad, get upset, and just say, I'm done with you and kick them out. Or, you know, you can help facilitate a softer transition for that person. You know what? And honestly, it, it, I mean, I've seen Muhammad do it so gracefully, <laughs> you know, a number of times. You know, and um, I, I, there's nothing to be lost by helping someone make a turn and take a different trajectory. So, so it's not it's not necessarily a failure. It's just a different trajectory. So. What do you think is, um, from your experience, the biggest preventable mistake that new faculty make? From your view. A lot of them. <laughs> I mean, definitely the, the taking on people too fast to who weren't qualified is for sure a big one. It's definitely like just general. Gosh, I just have such a long. List. I know exactly. I'm trying to think like how to sort them. <laughs> yeah. Generally, lack of organization is huge. I mean, if you can be organized, you know, stupidly easy things like having an online calendar, taking notes on things, you know, all these kinds of things that it would save you so much time. But if you don't do it in the beginning, it, it's it's hard to get into it later. There's, so I have written down on my whiteboard right now, fail fast. It's the only thing on my whiteboard that I refuse to allow anybody to erase. What says embrace apathy? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. You're going in a different direction with this. <laughs> fail fast is, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, fail fast is basically a reminder that I want to put enough thought into the experiments that we're testing so that they will give me an up or down uh -huh. answer for a project. Because for me, one of the things that is most impactful that I've struggled with is how to get an up and down answer for a project. Second thing, <laughs> I'm not going to go through the whole list of things that I've learned. Um, but another thing I would say that has been really helpful is that I have about 15 different strategies for how to prioritize. And so, because, so this list is abbreviated. Um, <laughs> uh, 
it doesn't include a lot of stuff that just sort of falls on your plate. And, and um, as someone who likes to keep an incredibly high standard for everything, it's important to prioritize in a way that allows me to drop things productively. Right. Um, so, for example, I was, I was telling them earlier, sometimes if I'm having a week where I feel like I'm not necessarily spending the time I want on the things I want to, at the end of each day, I'll pretend I get to relive the day and say, okay, which three hours do I triage and what would I put in instead? And somehow that makes, and it, it has to be three hours. So even if I had a really productive day, it allows me to, to sort of make the decision about whether I'm spending my time in the right way, using the assumption that I'm not, right? So, so it allows me to bypass that sense of failure that comes with not getting everything done and just come up with or sort of play with how I might do things differently. So I guess I would say um, priorita prioritizing is a major challenge and there are a million different ways to make mistakes. I found one really big one, and this is actually something that's inordinately common, especially for people who come from postdocs like here at Duke, and that's going into the faculty position and only swinging for the fences. You know, basically, like you go into your new lab, and let's say, I mean, some people get positions at jobs at places like Duke, some people get places, you know, other places like UNC or whatever, you know, different, different levels of resources will be available for you. But you're coming now probably from a fairly high power lab that's pretty well established, that's publishing in top places like very regularly. You go in as a new faculty member and you're like, okay, how long will it take us to get this thing into cell or whatever or something like that? And the answer may be longer than tenure. <laughs> and you have to realize that like, you know, you don't have this whole machine already set up. And you may not have the machine, and you will probably eventually have that machine, but you may not have that machine set up in your first six years. And a lot of people go in and they don't they don't have the, the basically the base hits as, as our proboscide corporal calls them. You know, the, those small projects that you know can be completed, that are safe, that are publishable, and will get out there. And get your name out there, get recognition, bring people into your lab, and all goes in there. But some people go in and they just have this massive, like, oh, there's this vision, oh, I can do this, and it'll take probably only like three years. And my advisor actually had great advice on it. said, figure out how long you think it'll take and multiply by three. Yeah. So if you think it's going to be three years, then, you know, okay, then, you know, uh, two years after you're denied tenure, yeah. you, you might finish it up. <laughs> not, a, not a good plan. <laughs> so definitely have, like, different sizes of projects and have something that can be completed fast. Don't just wait for the cell paper or for the nature or whatever. <coughs> lost biology for the open access. Or <laughs> so. Does the department that you're in um, ever pressure you? Or what kind of pressures do you feel from the department to do different activities, service or this or that? And how do you say no without, yeah. you know, ruffling too many feathers? Assistant professors have a lot of leeway on this most of this. It depends on how sympathetic your department chair is, but most places, assistant professors, you say, I'm on tenure, I really need to protect my time. Usually, like, you know, as long as you're not doing zero other stuff, they'll usually leave you alone. Once you get tenure, though, man, it's good. It's, yeah. It all gets dumped on your plate. Yeah. <laughs> but you get a lot of protection from that. The, what I advise, too, I think this is in the book, too, in terms of service, too, is, is look through, like, what committees are out there and ask to get on one. And that way, then, you'll get on one that you actually want that may benefit you, like, for example, the Graduate Recruitment Committee. Something like that as opposed to being on the, like, some stupid committee that nobody cares about that you won't care about either. It'll, it'll feel like just a drain of your time. So, but, you know, just pick one and then say, well, I'm on the one. I'm, I'm, I'm booked as an assistant professor. Um, I'm actually pressured to do less in the way of service or less attention to teaching, which I think, I think is correct. I yeah. think that's the correct <laughs> direction for me. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but it will depend on the department, and you do... I do have friends who are pressured to do sort of absurd things. I had one friend who was asked to buy the cookies for the speaking seminar series that she was asked to set up. And we had this, it was amazing, we had this amazing discussion about how to, how to explain that that was not an appropriate job. Um, so, so it's very individual. One of the colleges at Oxford, the newest faculty member has to spread the snuff on their arm and take it around for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not kidding, it's serious. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there are some crazy places. Yeah, so, so, so I, maybe I'm just lucky, but most of the pressures I get are in the opposite direction. So this is kind of the reverse question, if you want to get on a committee, you can. So I have a friend who is relatively early in her tenure track, she's about to start her third year. And so after two years, she wants to become more involved. But the problem is, it's a very, it's a small. There's like six, six faculty members in the department, and 
they have been on committees for years. They don't want to leave those committees, and so she's kind of struggling and frustrated. She wants to be on a committee, but there are no opportunities. So what do you do in a situation like that? Well, hopefully it, there's more committees than just at the department level, right? You know, so, so I think it goes back to what Muhammad suggested, which is sort of look broadly, maybe not just within the department. Just as a for example, you know, maybe she's a diversity candidate, or maybe she's not, but she's really passionate about improving diversity at the campus. You know, more often than not, there's diversity committees which sort of span departments and schools and so forth. So, so maybe look above the department, look more at the school level and the institutional level for committees which, you know, kind of interest her. You know, and then as mom had said, contact people. Just say, hey, I'd really like to get involved. It's, it's interesting, so the, the way you phrased the question is interesting because the problem to solve in the question is how to get on a committee, which, first of all, is never a problem I want to solve. But, <laughs> but, but second of all, um, usually there's a motive or a mission that any given committee has, mm -hmm. right? There's there's a reason for being, um, and that I I like the suggestion that you can look around for other opportunities to serve the community. I would also say I'm a very mission oriented person, and um, and I can identify all sorts of things that I would love to change. You want to be very careful not to ruffle feathers, ruffle feathers right? But I can identify all sorts of things that I would like to change if I had the extra energy to invest in that way. Um, so if, if the thing she really feels is missing from her life is um, some form of service, then maybe there's some form of mission that she has that she actually wants, like she has a problem she wants to solve. And that may fit into the purview of one of the committees. Um, also, depending on the sort of charter of committees, the number of members may be flexible. So it may be that if she has a, a mission mm -hmm. and some problem she wants to solve, she can go to the committee and say, hey, this is something I'm passionate about. I know you guys are full. I would love to serve the community in this way. Do you have any advice on how I should do that? Would it be most effective if I tried to, to work with you guys? Would it be most effective if I did this other thing? Um, mm -hmm. So. Committee service for, for the sake of committee service is sort of like when I go to a meeting and I lead it really poorly, right? But, but sort of living your daily life for a purpose. There is, there's off-campus service too, not just on-campus. Yeah. So for example, that's that if you want to review too. for a journal, if you write the end of that journal, I'm sure you won't get to review this. I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. the first, the first grant the first panel I was on, the first grant panel I was on, I wrote to my program officer at NSF and said, can I get on a panel? I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> the first associate editor job I got, I wrote to the editor general saying, hey, do you need more associates? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I scaled it appropriately. I didn't aim, I didn't set, you know, I wasn't like a first year professor saying I had to sell. You know, no, I aimed it sort of appropriately where it's someplace I actually thought I could get. But, you know, that opened the door. They're like, oh, look, here's somebody who actually does service and does it pretty well. That opened up future doors for both. Well, in this case, it's not so much service for the sake of service. It's more as a way to feel less isolated and more involved in the department. Uh, I was out of the loop especially in a department that's kind of physically scattered across the campus. So are there other ways that you would suggest doing that if you're in that kind of situation other than committee service? Well, so Jenny's discussion gave me another idea, which is maybe she wants to start a, a, a committee. You know, maybe there actually is something she is passionate about, a particular problem or a particular hole that she feels needs to be filled, yeah. So perhaps she could start one. It, it sounds like the sense of community is the thing that she's yeah. seeking when she's seeking committee service. And um, that's not something I've ever gotten from a, <laughs> from a committee. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. But, um, but there are a ton of different ways to generate a sense of community. <clears throat> depending on the type of department. Um, you can take a bottom-up 
or a top-down approach. Bottom-up is always going to be more successful. So um, one of the things that Duke Chemistry has a phenomenal community that um, was principally social among the graduate students rather than intellectual. Um, and so one of the things that I've uh, had my students do for group meetings, I don't know what kind of an institution this person is at, but if there are six people, then probably principally undergrads are the, the students she's working with. Um, but I have my students come to every group meeting with a five minute presentation on the work of somebody else in another lab. So I sort of use them to uh, create intellectual community around the department at their level. And, and a couple of times this has been reciprocated. Um, and there are other groups who have actually experimented with doing this as well. So, yeah. so there are different ways. You just have to be creative. I was wondering, like maybe a related question that how, as a new faculty member, how do you find yourself a mentor? I, I, a lot of new faculty say like they're, you know, they're afraid to ask questions because that will make them look weak, vulnerable, like a new kitten or something. Um, so <laughs> how do you go about forming community? I mean, do you, and are you expected to go to the holiday social parties with the department or can you go home and soak your feet? You know? God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, so there's this concept that you have one mentor, right? You don't have one mentor. You have an infinite number of potential mentors. And one of the challenges when you step into a department is that there is a whole history behind the, the relationships between different people that you frankly don't want to know. Right? <laughs> you, you want to know just enough to not step in it. Um, yeah. And then to sort of move productively through your life. So you just sort of have to start to get to know the strengths and areas where you would trust different faculty members in the department, and that's by just yeah. getting to know people, but you may also want faculty members outside of the department. I use, I yeah, I use, this is sad, I use my parents as, <laughs> as mentors for, specifically my father as mentors for anything that is so politically contentious that I'm frightened to talk about it with people in the department, and I will role play conversations with him about, you know, how do we bridge this topic and who, who do I have this conversation with? Um, One big thing is just not to be afraid. So I mean, and Molly's question is about like, when you're afraid of it. I mean, uh, I forget who it is, Thomas Jefferson, Frank Franklin. One, <laughs> one of those people had some famous quote of like, what's the best way to get somebody to, to like you is to ask them for a favor. When you come to somebody and say, I want your advice, what are you, what are you implicitly telling them? I respect you, I want to emulate you. I mean, that is incredibly flattering. Nobody's gonna say like, oh, I don't wanna vote for that person's tenure because they didn't already know the law. You know, odds are this person's gonna fake it, they don't even know either. <laughs> They're probably just gonna come up with something to say, you know, move on from there. But really, I mean, don't be afraid. Ask for, ask for advice and ask for advice multiple times. And don't feel obliged to follow the advice. I mean, that's why it's called advice rather than dictation. It is, it is very hard as a, it is very hard as a new faculty member, nobody's looking over your shoulder. People sometimes say, department chair, I, I'm the department chair right now, I have no idea what most of my faculty are doing. I, mean, I know their general research programs, but I have no idea like how they're doing like, you know, month to month or even year to year in terms of how things are going. So, I mean, you really are kind of on your own. It's very important to try to get as much feedback as possible. You have your old advisors still, they're not dead. I will call them. So, you know, contact your old, maybe they're not. Contact your old postdoc advisor, your graduate advisor. Get, I mean, they, they have incentive to help you because your success reflects yeah. very positively upon them. Like, oh, look, my former student now got tenure at blah, blah, blah. I mean, they have incentive to help you. They have incentive to look over your grants and, and help you do really well. And just people in the department, like Jenny said, like they invested probably like on the order of a million dollars in you if you add your salary and start all things over the time. They, they don't want to then have to start over with a new person. They are very happy to have you succeed. Because again, it reflects well on the whole department for you to succeed. I have a question about navigating departmental politics. <laughs> that touches a little bit on something Jenny just said. Sure. So I'm beginning to realize as a postdoc that people sometimes care very deeply about things that would never occur to me. Oh my god, I could tell you <laughs> stories on this. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, are there things that you would tell me that help you to watch out for? Be careful, people are going to have feelings about that. This is a way to navigate. I do that actually. As a department chair, I will sometimes, if there's a, so we have a fact member who was hired two years ago and, and it was, there was an issue that was standing in this person's, I actually called her into my office and said, look, 
I just want to give you the backstory on this so you understand where things are coming from. And after I explain, she's like, oh, now I understand what was happening there in the room. Because th there's always a backstory for all, anything that's contentious, there's always a backstory. And, and people will get different bits of it. So, I mean, you may get some of that, you may get some of that from the department chair, you may get some of that from other faculty. The, the thing to watch out for, though, is you may also get a very polarized, you know, one-sided version of whatever that thing is. So, as well as it's, it's as good as much as you can, especially as an assistant professor steer starts. Away. Exactly. Yeah. Steer <laughs> clear. Like, listen, yeah. say thank you, but just don't. Yeah. yeah. As, it, as much as you can. Sometimes you have to wait until because it has to do with something like a teaching assignments, and you have to have you have to have a teaching assignment. Yeah. But you know, just as much as you can, just steer clear of it. You know, the, the best thing you want people to say about you is that, oh man, that person, their nose is to the grindstone. They're working. You don't want them to. They think this. They. Think, the other thing, the the other thing I was going to mention, don't take on other people's enemies. No. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, uh, my postdoctoral advisor, who <laughs> will remain nameless, um, <laughs> was very, very polarizing. And she managed to irritate people all over the place. And once she was gone and my identity was separate from hers, you know, I was working with people and communicating with people very well and very positively because I created my own relationships with these people. So, you know, of course you're going to hear stories. You know, of course there's going to be bad blood between different people. Remain Switzerland as much as you can. You know, and always remember, you know, that just because somebody <laughs> had a bad experience with this person, that doesn't really mean that you will as yeah. well. You know, a lot of the times, you know, and, and you guys can s sort of give your feedback on this. From my perspective, a lot of the times there's bad blood is fights over resources, whether yeah. it's money, whether it's space, time. time, whatever it is, you know, it's it's some commodity <coughs> that folks are fighting over. You know, and you may not have those same difficulties with that person. The other thing I'd say is oftentimes if you're seeing someone behave disproportionately to what you might otherwise expect, um, there's a lot else that could be going on, right? It could be about they're not feeling respected at home and then this thing triggers their sense of lack of respect. It could be about anything. So, um, True for your trainees too. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely that's true as well. And I would say I walk into any situation assuming that it's not about me, right? Not, 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 because I then want to make it about me, but because, because, so I assume, you know, whatever it is is not about me. I can listen respectfully and empathetically without, um, so I can be a supportive human being without being a, um, well, without being involved or dragged into it in any way, shape, or form, right? I, I can say, wow, that sounds really tough. You know, there are empathetic listening skills that you can use when you happen to stumble upon some explosive topic. But um, my general approach is to try to steer it as clear as possible, right? If someone comes to me and is explaining something really traumatic, I will be supportive and I will then extricate myself from the situation. And I, I won't carry that on to my relationship with whatever has traumatized. I had a uh, question about, sorry, uh, <laughs> my turn, I just didn't look at the people. All right, question is about writing, basically. Like, how would you, is there any particular strategy that you recommend that to write more, um, and I guess write more productively? In, um, this is something that I'm struggling with a little bit. You know, I mean, now all I've managed to just spend some time, like the hour base every day in front of a computer, but the volume that I'm producing is not enough. I feel like the pressure will be significantly higher when you become faculty because all the grants and everything, and papers. Anything else that you use or you're using right now that might be helpful? 
expect us to be very person specific on how yeah. that's actually so done. But yeah. I, mean, I can tell you what I do personally. That you know, let's say for example, it's a grant proposal. You know, the, the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll I'll try to I'll essentially try to write like an abstract first because I mean, when you're writing a grant proposal, like you have to sell an idea. People are not going to read through 12 pages to find the idea. They need to like get it or they don't get it. So you, you have to start with that and then basically design everything else around it. So I, I'll do like I'll basically do something like an abstract. Like this is here's like four bullets of what I'm actually trying to get from this, and then. I'll do an outline from that, and I'll just read a ton of papers. I'll just start. I'll just start adding random sentences. I'll, I'll have like a word document. I'll just start adding random sentences and citations for them, and then I'll then start working that in later on. Like, oh, okay, how does this now flow with with regard to these ideas, and then put it all together that way. But usually, I mean, basically, what ends up happening is people come up with a with a, a template in some sense of how you do stuff, and you just end up following that template. Like, for example, if you look at all my papers, the introductions follow exactly the same template. Yeah. It <laughs> does know? get easier over yeah. the time. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I depend on whether it's a grant application or whether it's a manuscript. I do it a little differently. Yeah. If it's a grant application, I usually put specific aims page together yeah. first. And I gotta be honest, I will put an inordinate yeah. amount of energy into specific aims. Why? Because I've been a reviewer, exactly. and I know read. that's what people read. And if you do not get that page right, you've already lost. Doesn't matter what the rest of the pages are. So, uh, so the it's opposite great. is also true that if you have an awesome specific game, the rest of it can be kind of yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, with a manuscript. Usually, I will start with methods of results, and then I'll book it. Um, but it, but in terms of practically doing it too, you know, it can be really hard to find time, and especially as you go go through your career, you know, this list, you know, <laughs> seems to get longer and longer and longer. You know, it's hard to find productive writing time. So there's times. To be honest, I'll just say, I'm staying at home today, you know. So there's no kids, the kids are in school, there's no graduate students, no postdocs, no meetings, because I just canceled all my meetings, you know, and I just immersed myself. But that's because that's how, just as, as mom would say, we're all different. So I have to focus. I can't have distraction. Um, I treat it like an experiment. <laughs> I could use this for every question, <laughs> uh, and I'm not great at it yet. Um, some people are timeline driven, some people are deadline driven, so if you notice that you're somebody who writes a lot more effectively when a deadline is on you, take advantage of that to set earlier deadlines, mm -hmm. and then um, to figure out what you need to do. If the, the barrier to writing is that you're um, concerned about putting down something that's high quality and the first time you write anything it just sounds like garbage, then just the first time you write it, assume it's going to be garbage and keep going. And then go back and fix it. What was I really trying to say here? Um, which is, you want to make sure you go back and fix it. <laughs> uh, if, if you need blocked out time, I actually disappear from my office for large swaths of time. I go, and for me, the most effective place to write depends on what I'm doing. So um, you can find me at the Mad Hatter for two hour chunks surrounding a lunch um, a couple days a week in, in times when there's no class. Um, or you can find me at Coco Cinnamon in the evenings if I'm not writing, but I'm trying to get the sort of background information if it's something less intensive. Um, recently I heard, no, I was listening to an audiobook, and they were suggesting that for a lot of people who are studying, so this is focused on study habits of kids, I think, but you take information from wherever you get it, uh, Actually, rotating the location is important, but for a lot of other people, having a consistent space is important. So, so the reason it's an experiment is because um, you may or may not.
take note of when you're being effective and when you're being ineffective. But if you're able to figure out what does work for you, you can build on that. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, the financial aspect of it? So you come in and presumably you've got a startup, you've got a big pot of money. How do you decide to allocate it? Are there people in the department who help you keep track of it, or is it just yeah, you with your Excel question. spreadsheet? That's very different by university. So I, I didn't start at Duke. I started someplace else. And it's extremely, it's extremely stressful, right? Because you're given something like, you know, say half a million dollars, a million dollars, and, and it's a one-time thing. You never get another startup. You know, this is it. <laughs> and you know, you're buying these big pieces of equipment. Like, should I spend this forty thousand dollars for this thing, or should I just hang on to it? Maybe I'll change my mind in a year. It's very, very stressful deciding what to buy. At some level, you know, like, so startups often expire. So that's something to watch out for, first yeah. off. And, and ask people, ask the chair and ask other faculty if the expiration is formal or is it just in writing. So here at Duke, for example, like your startup will expire after like two or three, three years. years. But, but if you haven't spent it, I've never heard of anybody who, at the three-year mark, is not able to get another three-year extension. So you, know, you have to check and see, like, oh, OK. I don't, actually, I don't actually have to get rid of the three years, but I may get six. Contrast, when I went to LSU, they told me I had to spend, so similar to Jenny, actually, I had to spend I forget what it was, a third or half of my startup by X date. It was like basically my arrival date. So <laughs> on one hand, it was great because you know, I got there and it was like Christmas. There's boxes everywhere. <laughs> but on the other hand, it was very stressful. I'm like, okay, get it out there, get it out there. It was nice because what I did is I walked around the lab I was in as a postdoc. And basically, anytime I touched, I'm like, oh, shoot, that's right, you mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, yes. Yeah. So that was actually very useful in doing that sort of thing. Um, in terms of actually just managing the, the, the numbers to see like, how much have you spent, how much have you not spent, it's a very good, so before you even take the job, they'll probably ask you for a startup list, and you will itemize it in there as something, it'll give you some idea. Those numbers will almost certainly be inflated, your numbers will almost certainly be inflated, not intentionally, but because you get pretty big discounts, and they have these like, you know, new lab discounts and things like that from the sales reps. So you'll actually have, if, you know, let's say for example you need 500,000 startup, you got 500,000 startup, you'll actually probably have an extra at least 100,000, if not more. To play with, maybe actually a lot more. Do you that? Or? Well, I think I did some really good things, but uh, and, and so I I do fit into that category. But I also know people who say, absolutely not, you run out immediately because you forgot to put X, Y, and Z. That, that does happen yeah. too. And so, so I think it sort of depends on. Yeah, you will get balances um, too from the department. I got this both my old place and my new. However, at, at my old institution, the balances that I got were not always right. Yeah. So <laughs> you need to actually check that. Sometimes it was like not right because you know X charge hadn't cleared, which you know isn't necessarily a big deal if it's a like you know two hundred dollar thing. It's a huge deal if it's a fifty thousand dollar thing. You know, if you if you're off by that order of magnitude, it's really problematic. Sometimes it's just to be perfectly blunt. Sometimes there's a competence issue of whoever is preparing that spreadsheet for you. So as much as possible, keeping your own version of it, at least for the big stuff. Is good and getting things in writing, saying I need a confirmation of exactly how much I have right now, very regularly is very very useful to have. The, the other suggestion that I was going to have too is, you know, I ask your postdoctoral mentor for a copy of their budgets yeah. from their grants. That that I think is really helpful. The one thing I, I mean, we we've been spending a lot of time talking about equipment, but. You know, everybody's field is very different. So I can tell you from what I feel in human genetics, there's a lot of core equipment, you know, that I wouldn't need to buy if I was starting my own lab, right? I mean, I'm not going to buy an aluminum high seek, you know, most likely, right? If I'm a new investigator, presumably there's one on campus you have access to, but I will need a lab manager, you know, and I will need the smaller equipment. So, uh, so for my grants, my grants are actually very personnel heavy, but, but that may be different no, no. From, from there. So, so I, think, I think you need to think about those things as well. You know, and sometimes in these sort of packages, things are spelled out a little more explicitly to you. This amount of money for equipment, yeah. this amount for personal. So, but, you know, mom is comment about sort of keeping track of what you spent. 
it's really important. And I would say not even just as a young investigator, even as a senior investigator, because there are competency issues, you know, but, you know, just, just keep trying. There's different strategies too on how to how to spend the start in a sense. So it's connected to what Jane was talking about about some people who used up their start. Some people, some people. I've heard senior PIs telling us, you know, basically like spend out your start right away, get as much data as possible because that's the only way you're you're going to be most likely to get tenure. I think that I don't completely agree with that point of view. I understand it, but I don't completely agree with that point of view. Just like you know, spend it out like in this big you know blaze of glory. <laughs> it may or may not be a blaze of glory. It may just be a blaze. <laughs> I, I personally was a lot more conservative with my startup, where I was like, I held on to it, like, let me hold on to this just in case of emergency, and several emergencies did hit, and it was very useful having that extra pot of money that was there, because it's flexible. Startup, unlike grants, is much more, you can buy computers and things like that, it, it is absolute sheer hell to try to buy a computer with a grant. And there's a lot of other pieces of equipment that you can't get. There's even stupid stuff. Like, for example, we, we would do these uh, polythene chromosome squashes and we need paper towels for it. You cannot, no matter what you do, build the stupid paper towels to the grant. So, I mean, you know, yes, you can steal them from the bathroom, but it's better if you can actually like, <laughs> build your startup or something like that. There's other more bigger expenses than paper towels, of course, too. No, that's <laughs> so, so, just kind of getting down to the nitty gritty stuff, but like, let's, once you've kind of bought equipment and you have it there, and let's say you've been fortunate enough to receive an R01, for yeah. instance. What does an R01 fund? Ah, great, great, like great. A postdoc, so a student, a tech? It's very, uh, this is very, going to be very field dependent. Yeah. It, for example, for me, I, I tend to have huge sequencing costs built in. So for me, yeah. and, and also depends on whether you're going for R01 or like say an NSF grant. Just to give you an idea of what things cost, you know, a postdoc, a starting postdoc would be around 40K, right? Yeah. But you have to add a quarter again to that for fringe. Yes. Right, and so this is now this is just this is just direct cost. We're not talking about total cost. We'll come back to that in just a second. So, so for a postdoc, if you add a quarter again, you're basically looking at 50k for an entry level postdoc ish. Mm. Right, so that's that's barely anything at that point. If you have a tech on top, it's probably going to be a, a fairly similar amount, maybe a tiny bit less. So that you're looking at 100k. You're probably going to want some salary on it for yourself. <coughs> let's say, for example, you're taking some summer salary. I'm just making up a number. Let's say your starting salary is like 80k or something, or uh, I should say, let's say 90k. It makes a nice round just number. Just pick a round number. Yeah. yeah. So let's say your starting salary is 90k, and you want one month summer salary. It's not very much salary, right? So that's 10,000. But again, you have to add a quarter again. <laughs> so I mean, at this point, we've already spent like half of the max modular amount of NIH, exactly. and you've spent and you've done exactly zero for any sort of travel. You've done exactly zero for yep. any sort of sequencing, any sort of equipment, any supplies. But you've spent half of it there on just one month summer salary, a tech, and a postdoc. And it's entry level postdoc. If you already had a postdoc who's been there and been successful, they may be a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. right? So it, it's, things add up quickly. And then there's this whole overhead thing, which I don't know, if, if, I don't know how much you guys are familiar with this. That basically, like, the university adds a, a 50 plus percent tax to whatever you get. So, which NSF deals with total costs, NIH tends to do things with direct costs. So you know, if you talk about max module with NIH, it's usually 250000 And NSF looks at the, the, basically the total amount they are going to be giving out. So instead of saying 250000 they'll say, oh, but Duke will put a 50% tax on that. So it's going to be really like closer to $400,000. Yeah. And, and what that does is that supports you know, your, your grant administration, it supports the libraries, it supports the English department, it supports, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the chancellor's office. What's that? The paper towels in the bathroom. Paper towels yeah. in the bathroom, yeah. exactly. Postdoctoral yeah. services office. <laughs> it supports all those things, but basically those numbers add up very quickly. And, and you know, depending on whether you're going to NSF or NIH, you will look at it very differently whether you're working with direct costs or you're working with your total cost. Yeah. But again, mostly personal. Yeah, personal is very heavy. Um, uh, I want to ask a question about how to find a teaching faculty. How to find a teaching faculty? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean to a position or find somebody to teach? No, find a position. Find a position. Because I, I don't have a PhD uh, degree, I don't have a, but I have two masters. Mm -hmm. so I, but I want to find an academic position inside a, a school. That's, That's a great question. So when you say a teaching position, do you mean a position that involves some teaching or do you mean a position where most of it is actually teaching. Like, give me like, it, it, so there's there's many different levels. I, so. I, for yeah, for, for me, I I think I'm better at teaching than uh, doing research. Okay. So the research is 
years before a lot of literary experiences, but uh, for some reason I didn't have a, a, a lot of publications. So Absolutely. But I, 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 have, uh, I think I'm good at teaching. Okay. So there's a full spectrum, even within what we call teaching. So, for example, one of my former students, Shannon McDermott, said she wanted to stop doing research entirely. <laughs> Basically, she wanted to just stop. So she applied to community colleges for that sort of thing. And their, their, their positions are entirely teaching. And what some people think is they say, oh, I want to go to a place like UNC Greensboro because there's more teaching. Like, that is a, I mean, even though they don't have a PhD program, it is still considered a research university. Right? That, like, you can't go there and say, like, I don't have, I don't have any, any publications. They won't hire you without that. There's a full spectrum between there's the, the traditional undergrad institutions, the Swarthmore's, Bowdoin College, things like that. Again, there, you're, there will be a lot of emphasis on undergraduate engagement and teaching, things like that, but they still expect some sort of research program, and you're involving students in this research program. So there's a full spectrum there yeah. across which, and the, the, what they'll be looking for will be very different. So for some place like the community college, uh, I'll take the extreme example first, they're going to be looking very much at teaching experience. TA, like I said, that will buy you zero. Like it, it, if you say IT in these three classes, you know, you're not, not even competitive, not even remotely competitive. But what they actually want is that you've been instructor of record for multiple different kinds of classes, for laboratory classes, for lecture classes, things like that. And that's what they really want to see happen. And there are opportunities for doing that, even as a postdoc right now, if you have time. Um, Durham Technical Community College, here, which is here in town, they will, you know, they will take on people from here at Duke to teach, for example, an evening class. So you can still be doing your research that's funding your, your position right now during the day, but then go over there and do a, a class in the evening. They're very happy to have that sort of uh, support. And that's the kind of, uh, re basically, a resume of that sort of work is what you would need to build up to be competitive for those kinds of jobs. Again, as you go then to more of the, say, the Bowdoin College, the, the traditional undergraduate things, they do want to see that you are successful research, but very importantly, there, what they want to see is that you're going to be able to engage their undergraduates in research. That you have experience working with undergraduates, and not just, you know, that, oh yeah, I have this person, they watch dishes for me. But no, 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 no. There is an undergraduate who developed an independent research project, and they were able to take it to the point of publication, and I was their direct supervisor through the whole process, and not just one, but like a, a stream of them to be competitive. So you don't want to just apply, you want to be competitive for them, right? So that's the kind of thing they will be looking for there. The, the, the third, the other end of the extreme, as I mentioned, of uh, say UNC Greensboro. I mean, it's, they will look at your teaching a little bit, but it's mostly going to be about your research, even though people here might call it a teaching school. It's, it's really considered from their point of view at, the, at a research university. Wow. Um, speaking of teaching, on that sure. note, like, it seems like when you're going for tenure and you're young, yeah. teaching doesn't matter that much, but you're still expected to do it, so how do you balance Great time commitment <laughs> that you're going to invest in something that ultimately might not make a difference? And I guess the second part is how does it differ at a school like Duke versus yes. a UNC Greek? That's program. what I was going to say. Yeah. So at, at, at Duke, our former provost, not the current one, our former provost had a quote. You came under Peter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had a quote. He said something like, if, if you have excellent research and poor teaching, we'll give you tenure until you improve your teaching. Right? So that gives you an idea of the relative weight. He also said if you have excellent teaching, and weak research, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Basically, the only way teaching would matter is right on the border. That if, you know, if your research was kind of just almost there, and you had awesome teaching, OK. Whereas you had really weak teaching, then that would, might fail at your But it was really just on the margin. So in that sense, I mean, this is a really unfortunate thing, because I mean, you have these students who are paying you know, $60,000 to be here, if you include tuition and all these other things. And we're basically incentivizing faculty to kind of not give up a blank about them. <laughs> Which is a little bit unfortunate, but it is a reality. I mean, and the students, to some extent, they know that. I mean, basically, Duke is a good investment for people who want to get into involved in research. If you're coming here and you have no desire to be involved in research, you're just coming to your classes. You know, honestly, I, I think you came to the wrong place. I mean, I think you, should, you, could, you could have used your money better someplace else. So, from your point of view, I mean, how should you invest the time? As much as possible, you know, get the papers out, and you'll get a lot of flexibility. The more the more you can teach the same class, the less the time investment will be. So like, if you have to teach four different classes, you're not going to do that well because you're going to have to redevelop everything for each one. But if you can teach, like, say, the same two classes, one in fall, one in spring, then that will really help because there will be that upfront time the first year, but then it's going to be largely kind of reiteration. After you have tenure, I will say the teaching actually does matter. And even here at Duke, it does matter. That for promotion to full professor, unlike from, uh, tenure, they actually do look heavily, heavily at teaching to the point that I can actually name multiple people who have actually been declined promotion to full professor on the basis of their teaching not being very strong. I think, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I do want to add one thing, which is um, the difference in time investment between me doing the best job or, or 
not the best job, but almost the best job yeah. that I could have envisioned doing, and doing like a barely passable job, is not actually that much difference, right? Because it takes so long. So he's quoting six hours to prepare a lecture for, for an hour. It probably, since I haven't looked at most of the undergrad material since I was an undergrad in, in the kind of way you need to, it probably took me about eight hours for one lecture. And I did almost the best job that I could. Um, and I'm actually glad to have invested that time because what I see um, in people who don't quite do that is the second year they're sort of strong-armed into investing that time. So on the one hand, the, the sort of party line is it doesn't matter uh, as long as you meet a certain bar, a certain minimum bar. That certain minimum bar is actually pretty high considering that at least I hadn't done any instructor of record stuff before. And so the difference between meeting that bar and uh, sort of me putting in an appropriate amount of effort to do the, the almost best job that I could, I'm saying that, because I could have done you know, better, but not, not without a ton more time. That difference is not that much. And so the approach I took was shooting for, this may or may not be, was shoot for acceptably good to me because the sort of minimum bar is sufficiently close to that that it wasn't clear that I would clear it. And I, I know that um, I know that there are people who don't clear it and who do put in a bunch of effort, so you might as well uh, walk away from the first experience of teaching a class thinking, okay, I can pretty much do what I did last time, rather than thinking, my gosh, I put in all this effort and I still have to redo it entirely because I didn't meet that bar. All right. So, so I was going to make a slightly different suggestion about your question. From my perspective, you know, I would say be strategic about the courses you teach. Sometimes you may not have that luxury. You know, in the biology department, we had, you know, there is such a hefty need to teach specific courses to the grad, to the undergrads. You may not have this luxury, but here's a for instance. You know, a number of the courses that I've taught have been with the graduate students reading papers. Well, you need to be reading papers anyway. <laughs> That's not such a horrible type of course to be teaching. Secondly, consider participating in some of the team taught courses where you know, maybe you only have to do a quarter of the lectures instead of all of them, something like that. But, but think about ways to be strategic. You know, you're getting some experience, but, you know, maybe it's not yeah. taking on a, <laughs> a particular topic that, that you don't have, you know, a, a recent memory of, you know, and requires. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Further to that is, is decent teaching will help your lab in the sense that you'll actually get really good undergrads, especially if you can teach at the early stage and get people who are freshmen or sophomores who yeah. then like, oh my gosh, I love your class, I love the subject, can I come work with you? And you might then have them for two, three years. Yeah. That can sometimes be a win. Yeah. I have a feeling this question is going to make you cringe, but I'm going to ask it. Okay. So the question is about research productivity. Uh, you know, without a mentor, it's pretty hard to have a sense of whether or not you're hitting your productivity bars, and I, I realize this is going to be field specific, but just in broad strokes, roughly how many papers a year, independent grants, like what are people looking at in the sciences? There's, there's unfortunately really no answer to that question. <laughs> there's, there's really no way to answer that in general, even within, say, biology or something like that. There's no just across, I mean, zero is clearly not good. And actually, this is a quote from my, my former chair uh, from a long time ago. Zero is not good enough, and one is zero. <laughs> so, at that level, you, you can be very confident. But beyond that, I mean, as, as people always say, like let's say for example, you have one paper in a really top drill that completely reshapes how people view the field. I could actually name somebody who, at the time of tenure, they had I think three papers total, of which one was in really top drill, others who were kind of, eh. but that one completely changed the way this field was done, and that person got tenure. 
So I mean, there's there's no there's unfortunately no clear metric. There's no clear dollar amount for grants. No, I mean, if we get grants, I mean, let's say for example, you're a, a theoretical ecologist. I mean, okay, you've got your computer. Basically, you can be super productive with as long as, long as you get personnel covered in some way. You can be super productive with a very minimal amount of money. So unfortunately, there's really no metric we can raise for that. I've heard people say things like six figures, <laughs> impact factor six or above, but I mean that's crap. I mean, that's <laughs> well, yeah, but it's field specific. But but one of the things I was going to say, not so much about papers, but but grants, quality matters. Yeah. So what? You know, I, I don't know that you knew yourself in any papers at an assistant professor level trying to submit six grant applications in here, especially when, depending on the field, you may have one single study section that everything is going to, you know, and you know, reviewers remember, right? You know, and the other thing is, you know, you don't want to be competing against yourself, right? You know, a couple of times I've had multiple applications in the same study section. You know, if that happens, hopefully they're sufficiently distinct that they're not really competing against each other. But but do you get what I'm saying? So so sometimes, you know, you may do yourself more favors sort of holding back a little bit and really, you know, maybe only submitting three grant applications instead of six in a year. So I'm going to say, um, save yourself the trouble. Don't ask that question. Just assume you're not doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> like, just bypass the question. You don't have enough papers and you don't have enough grants. <laughs> What do you need to do to meet your other goals other than the goal of tenure? Because, right, whether I get tenure or not is potentially reliant on those things, or almost certainly, right? But there's no, there's no magic answer. And so if I invest my time trying to come up with a magic answer, that's time I'm not taking to actually do things that I value more than. Do you set personal goals? I guess this question is yeah. for three of you. Yeah, of and not only do I set personal goals, um, I have my students set personal <coughs> goals. And I've seen different labs do that in different ways. Um, every trainee that I have who's above the undergraduate level sets a, has a professional development plan that they write out and we talk about one-on-one -on -one every year. So they're supposed to <coughs> make a new PDP Maybe it's inventory. I think it's professional yeah. development plan every year. Um, there are different questions every time, and um, but there's a lot of overlap year to year. And one of my uh, and we revisit that through the course of the year. So a couple months in, I'll say, "Hey, it looks like now's a great time to review where we are, where we're standing. Are these still your goals?" But it gives you, it gives them a opportunity to. Um, trigger a conversation and it gives you an opportunity to trigger a conversation. I have a colleague who um, has her students set the goals in a group meeting and so they will hold each other accountable for it. I'm, I'm, I think we're almost at the point where my group has aged enough so that we can do that productively. I think that's really tricky for first year students. They have no idea and, and I don't want to sort of erode the likelihood of using it as a motivational forum by just having absurd goals at the outset. At the point in time you go for 10 or 2, they're going to be looking not just at the numbers, but they're really going to be looking at the impact. I mean, it's basically like, what is the science of scrutiny? Now, I should stress, that science has to have actually been published. <laughs> you know, so having amazing results, amazing research, and it's all in your notebooks, and you talk about it in your dossier, that doesn't help you. So that's an important thing about getting things out early, but really it's going to be like, what is the impact of your research? That's basically the question that when you're for tenure, that everybody, the university, the external reviewers, the provost, everybody's going to look at what is the impact of your research. And if that's, you know, chop, you know, 40 different times or three different times, I mean, it's the impact. Right? So I'm going to ask the work-life balance question. How do you stay sane? You know? <laughs> just kidding. Wow, well, we gave off a, a great conclusion of sanity. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
that's a good question. I think, you know, time is zero sum, right? I mean, there's no question about it. Time is zero sum. So, like, you know, for me, I have set amounts of time that when I go home, I'm going to spend this time from X to Y with my family. And if, you know, some undergrad student groups invite, invites me over, I say no. You know, if I, if I could be working on the paper, yeah, I could be working on the paper, but I, I'm not going to do that right then. So, and, and you have to do that. And there's always this guilt thing. The guilt thing sucks. Cause you're, you're always like, when you're with your family, you're like, I should be working on the paper. You're working on the paper. I should be with my family. And basically just, just pick something and, and go with it. Cause that's all you can really do. And the other big thing is get a housekeeper. Oh my God. <laughs> Housekeeper, it is so a, a million times worth the money because, like, you know, think about like, what are you guys, gonna, what are you gonna fight with with your advice. spouse? You're gonna fight with your spouse about like who's gonna clean the, the bathtub or whatever, something like that. Just have that taken off the table. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, like, okay. <laughs> um, I have no work-life balance. There are periods when I have beautiful work-life balance, and then there are periods when I'm all in one direction or all in the other direction. Um, so I'm just conscious. Right, right now. Yeah, you guys doing like do naps and sort of. Oh, I definitely hobby, go to the gym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have hobbies too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know yeah. about them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was swimming a lot until I injured my finger, and before that, I was climbing a lot until I injured my ankle. <laughs> so I think I'm about to start jogging a lot. Oh. <laughs> Don't tell me what the next injury is. Going to be. Um, I, you know. I, you have to be able to take breaks. You know, one, one of the things that, I, that I've observed, people who go and they go and they go and they go and they never take a break, yeah, they eventually crash. Totally. You know, I mean, one of the things... Or they die alone. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Science is creativity, you know, and if you haven't given your brain and your body, you know, an outlet and an opportunity to sort of recharge, then, you know, sitting in front of the computer for a 14 hour day is not going to be productive, you know. I mean, you know, and so. I think in some sense, too, you just have to listen to your own body. Like, a couple of weeks ago, one of my colleagues, who's an assistant professor, had just finished up sort of the October round of grant submissions, you know, and she had probably helped with, you know, over the course of two months, putting three grant applications together. She, she was spent, you know, she wasn't P.I. on but but she contributed greatly. So she said, I'm done. I just booked a trip to Paris. Thank God it was before all the other stuff oh, yeah, that was like, but, but you know, and, and she just listened to herself, you know, and she said, I just have to go. But the other thing which the two of us can tell me, you know, because I don't I don't <laughs> think you have kids. I don't have kids. But you know, having kids, you don't really get a choice, yeah. right? So kids have certain needs, that <laughs> they kind of need breakfast, they kind of need dinner, you know, <laughs> lunch you can pack for them, that kind of stuff. But, but you know, they have certain needs and they sort of force you know, on a particular schedule too. You can be honest, I mean, you, you, like, that's where life is. Like, you know, this job yeah. is great, but, I mean, come on. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. My kids is where it's at. I mean, yeah. my, as my advisor, my graduate advisor once said, he's like, you're not going to be lying on your deathbed thinking about that extra paper you could have published. <laughs> you know, you yeah. spent a little bit less time with your family. No. Yeah. That ain't going to be where it's at. Yeah. Okay, I think that is a good place to end. We've reached the limit of our time. Let's <laughs>